Today we're going to be talking about rational functions and how to represent rational functions and what they look like. We've already seen the parent function, the reciprocal function, which is the generic parent rational function, and we're going to be looking at different rational functions and their different properties. So first, let's look at an example from NBC's re reality TV show, The Biggest Loser Season 2, um, where we had Dr. Jeff Levine on the show. Dr. Jeff Levine, when he began the show, he weighed about 400 pounds and his body fat was 51.1%. So knowing this information, we can ask ourselves how many pounds of fat he had when he began the show. So in total, he had 400 pounds of body weight. 51.1% of that was fat. So to get the total pounds of fat, we take the total weight and multiply it by the percentage of body fat. And that will give us the total fat. So here we're essentially finding 51% of 400 pounds. So 400 times 51.1, we want to write it as a decimal, so 0.511, which will be equal to 204.4 pounds. So then we can continue with this example and say if he loses 10 pounds of body fat on this first part here, how much of fat will be left in his body in pounds? So he had 204.4 pounds and he lost 10 pounds, so you subtract that. So we get that he now has 194.4 pounds of body fat. And now we want to find what his new weight will be, assuming all the weight that he lost was fat. So his new weight, he's going from 400 pounds and he lost 10 pounds, so his new weight is 390 pounds. And then the next part is asking what percent of his total weight is going to be body fat. So we have his total weight is 390 pounds and his body fat is 194.4 pounds. So to figure out the percentage, we just divide these two. So the body fat is going to be the 194.4 pounds divided by 390 pounds. So his new body fat percentage is going to be as a decimal 0 0.498, which turns as a percentage is going to be 49.8%. Now let's generalize this. And instead of just saying specifically he loses 10 pounds of body fat, let's now look at if he loses X pounds of body fat. So if he loses X pounds of body fat, well, his new body fat amount is going to be the original amount, 204.4, minus the amount that he lost, which is x. And then his new weight, same thing. Take his original weight, which is 400 pounds, minus the amount of body fat that he lost, x. And so to get his new body fat percentage, we do the same thing. We take the amount of body fat and divide it by the total weight. So his body fat percentage will be found by 204.4 minus x, all divided by 400 minus x. And this will guarantee us to get his body fat percentage, no matter how many pounds of body fat that he loses. And so because we're doing this with an x value, we're actually creating a function here. In particular, this is what we call a rational function. So if we define our variables where x is the pounds of body fat lost, and y, or f of x, is the percent of body fat that he has in decimal form, then the function is going to be f of x is equal to, so that's the output, is equal to this ratio that we just got from above, the 204.4 minus x in the numerator, all over 400 minus x in the denominator. So this is a function where input is amount of body fat lost, and the output is his body fat percentage. And now that we have his body fat percentage as a function, we can do some input-output calculations to ask some questions and look at some different scenarios. So first, let's assume he loses 100 pounds of fat, so we want to figure out what his new body fat percentage is going to be. So 
losing 100 pounds of fat, we're saying x is equal to 100. And so we plug in 100 for x, or we're evaluating f of 100. And what we do is we just take our function and plug in 100 for x. So we have 204.4 minus 100 divided by 400 minus 100. And we can simplify that a little bit. 204.4 minus 100 is 104.4 divided by 400 minus 100 is 300. So put that into the calculator and we get this is about 0.348. And then as a percentage, that's 34.8%. So this is the body fat percentage if he loses 100 pounds. And then the next part is asking us if when he was eliminated, he had 21.8% body fat. We want to figure out how many pounds of fat he had lost. So we have this written as the output f of x is equal to 0.218 because we have to write it as a decimal. So we plug that into the f of x part. So that's the output. We're given the output and we're looking for x. So we have 0.218 is equal to 204.4 minus x divided by 400 minus x. So we want to solve for x here. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here because we have two x's floating around and one of them is in the denominator. So usually if you have x in the denominator, you want to get it out of the de denominator. So to quote cancel or divide out the 400 minus x or to get the x out of the denominator, we need to multiply this fraction by its denominator because when you multiply a fraction by its denominator, the denominator will divide out the part that you're multiplying it by. So if we multiply this by 400 minus x, we'll have that we have 400 minus x in the numerator and then 400 minus x in the denominator. So those divide out to one each time. But then we have to multiply that same thing on the other side. So we multiply 400 minus x here on the left hand side. And so now we distribute the 0.218 into the expression 400 minus x. And so what we have on the left hand side is 87.2 minus 0.218x. And this is equal to, we essentially divided out the denominator with that factor that we multiplied by the 400 minus x. So all we have left is the 204.4 minus x. Now this is a little bit more manageable because we have x on the right hand side, we have x on the left hand side. It's no longer in a fraction. And so now we just want to get all the x's on the same side and we want to get all the constant numbers, all the terms without x on the other side. And it doesn't matter which side we put the x's on or which side we put the constant values on. Um, but let's just add x over here. Let's put all the x's to the left hand side. So that adds to zero, add x over here. And then we're going to do two steps at once. Be brave, move the 87.2 over to the right hand side. So we subtract 87.2, that adds to zero, subtract 87.2 on the other side. And what we have left over here is negative 0.218x plus x or one x. So we're essentially doing one minus 0.218 and that gives us 0.782x is equal to now we're doing 204.4 minus 87.2 and that gives us 117.2 and then we want to get x by itself so last step we have to get rid of the 0.782 since it's multiplying x we divide so we get divide by 0.782 this divides to one and then we divide by 0.782 on the other side and we have at the end of the day x is approximately 149.87 pounds so in general to define a rational function and that's what we are working with here in this example of uh, dr levine is that the function that we made is a rational function. We call it a rational function because in the name rational it has the word ratio. So we're comparing we're two values in a ratio. So we're dividing two values or two polynomials. We're dividing them where in the numerator we have a polynomial function and then the denominator we have a polynomial function. 
Essentially, the important part is that we have x in the denominator, and that's what we call a rational function. And so with polynomials, if you recall, we had that there were no restrictions on the domain or on the inputs. You can plug in any number into a polynomial. There are restrictions, however, on rational functions, because when we start doing division, with division, we cannot divide by zero. So in other words, the denominator cannot equal zero. So that generally leaves us as a restriction on the domain, which means we're looking for what x values will make the denominator zero. So here we have 400 minus x. If we think about what would the x value be that makes the denominator zero, well, that would be x is 400. So x cannot be 400 here because then we would be dividing by zero. So the restriction on this domain is that x cannot be 400, and that's because we cannot divide by zero. In reality, in this application type problem or situation, there are more restrictions on x. Like For example, it, x can't be 400, but it also can't be more than 400 because he started with 400 pounds of body weight, so he can't lose more than he had. So let's take a deeper dive into some of these parent functions that we've looked at before with rational functions. The first parent function is the reciprocal function. The second one is the reciprocal squaring function. So with the reciprocal function, we have the function equation written out, f of x equal to one over x. And then we have the table written out all the way from negative four to four. But once we start getting close to zero, we count by one halves or by quarters. And that's because we wanna see the behavior when we get close to zero. So when the input is say negative two, the output is negative one half. When the input is negative one, the output is negative one. When the input is negative one half, however, this is the reciprocal function, which essentially means you're just flipping the fraction. So the output becomes negative two. And same thing with negative one fourth is the input, the output becomes negative four. So you're flipping that fraction and it becomes negative four. So when we plug in values that get closer and closer to zero, they get larger and larger. Well, if it's negative, they get more and more negative or less and less, but if you're positive, they get larger and larger. And so what happens is that as you get closer to zero for the input, you have this graph shooting straight up. And you can't actually include zero because we would be dividing by zero. And so this creates that restriction on x. So we say x cannot be equal to zero. And in fact, on the reciprocal squaring function, x cannot be equal to zero also. It's the same idea, but you're just squaring the input value when you do the reciprocal function. You square it and then do the reciprocal. So that's why it looks very similar, but it's all positive looking values here because you're squaring everything. And then the domain, it, we can plug in any value except for zero. The, there's only one specific input that is restricted here, and that's plugging in zero for x. So the domain, how we'd write that is you can plug in anything from negative infinity all the way up to zero, not including zero, so we use parentheses. Union, we start back up, you can include on the other side of zero, but not include zero, all the way up to infinity. So that's how we write that domain. And then the range for the reciprocal function is gonna be the same exact thing. We can't get zero out, but we can get anything else as an output. So to get that range, it's the same thing. It's from negative infinity, we go all the way down. And then we stop at zero or right before zero and then union that with start back up at zero, but right after zero and then all the way up to infinity. So you can see the graph is sort of cut in half going vertically, and it's also cut in half going horizontally at that y-axis and x-axis in this case, or where x and y are zero. And so the symmetry here is what we would call origin symmetry. Or remember, that's odd symmetry. And remember, with odd symmetry, this is saying that if you plug in a negative x value, we get out the negative value as if we were to plug in the positive x value. For example, if we plug in negative two, we get out negative one half. 
if we plug in positive 2, we get out positive 1 half. So when we swap the signs of the input, that swaps the signs of the output. That's what it means to have origin symmetry. And then identifying those same properties on the reciprocal squaring function, the domain is the same thing all the way from negative infinity up to zero, not including zero, and then from zero all the way up to infinity. So essentially, it's just long way of saying everything but zero. Union from zero to infinity. The range is a little bit different though because if we look at the graph, the graph or the outputs do not have any negative values because we're squaring everything. So when you square a number, it becomes positive. So what that means is that our output or our range values are from zero, not including zero, and they go up to positive infinity. So the range on the reciprocal squaring function is from zero to infinity. The symmetry here is y-axis symmetry. We can see that in the graph. We call that even symmetry. And remember what this means is that if we plug in a negative x value, that's the same thing as if we plugged in the positive version of that x value. For example, if you plug in negative 2, we get out positive 1 fourth. But if we plug in positive 2, we get out positive 1 fourth. It's the same thing. So we get out the same output if we make the input negative. Now the behavior we can talk about increasing, decreasing, those kind of things. If we follow the graph left to right, that's how we determine increasing and decreasing. Follow the reciprocal function left to right. If we look from negative infinity, follow this graph, it's actually going down here. So it's decreasing on this part here. So from negative infinity to zero, it's decreasing. And then it's also decreasing, start back up, at zero, if we follow the graph from left to right, it's going down here. The outputs are getting smaller. So this is always decreasing, but we'll just put a little skip here, just like the domain. So it's decreasing from zero to infinity, and then also from negative infinity to zero. And it's never increasing. However, on the reciprocal squaring function, follow the graph from left to right, all the way from negative infinity, follow the graph left to right, it's going up. So even though all the way to the left, if we go from left to right, it's increasing, but very slowly, and then it increases very quickly once we get close to zero. So the behavior here, at least on that first part, from negative infinity to zero, it's increasing. We always describe it using x values. And then go on the other side of zero, and on the right-hand side, we follow from left to right, the graph is going down, so it's decreasing from zero to infinity. And then let's talk about the end behavior, so the left-hand side and the right-hand side behaviors. As x approaches positive infinity, as x gets really big, as we look on the right tail or the right-hand side, the graph is actually getting closer and closer to zero. It never actually touches zero, but it's just flattening out right at zero. So that's how we would say the right-hand behavior of the reciprocal function. As x gets really big or as x goes to infinity, y goes close or approaches zero. And on the other hand here, if we look as x goes to negative infinity, so the left-hand side, the y values are also getting close to zero. They're just getting close to zero from the bottom side rather than from the top side. And then let's check the end behaviors on the reciprocal squaring function. So if we look at as x goes to positive infinity, that's the right-hand side, the y values are getting closer and closer to zero. And then same thing for as x goes to negative infinity, so the left-hand side, the outputs are getting closer and closer to zero. They never actually touch zero, but they just get close to it. So rational functions actually have a graphical feature which we call an asymptote. And we'll talk more and more about these asymptotes, and it's a very important characteristic of rational functions because it determines how a rational function will look. And essentially what an asymptote is, is that it is a line where the graph gets closer and closer to, but never actually touches that line or crosses it. In particular, with the vertical asymptotes, it gets closer and closer and never touches to the vertical asymptotes. And we can also have horizontal asymptotes. So on the original parent functions of 1 over x and 1 over x squared, the vertical asymptote is along the y-axis. And that's the line that x equals 0. And then the horizontal one is along the x-axis, which is the line 
y equals 0. So if we look at that scrolling up, what that means here, and we can see it a little bit more if I define the, the lines, this dotted line here, this is the vertical asymptote. And what that means is that the graph gets really close to the vertical asymptote and it just gets closer and closer and closer. And then for the horizontal asymptote, that's this line going across here is the horizontal asymptote. Now let's take a look at a couple rational functions and determine what is happening with the transformations and then use that to determine what the graph looks like. So with the transformations on this first one, it might be helpful to rewrite this as we can bring the two out front. So this is two times one over x. It's the same thing, we can just bring the two back in, in front because it's a whole number, we can write it like that. So the transformation that's happening here, the parent function is one over x, and the transformation that's happening is this vertical stretching because we're multiplying by two. So the transformation is a vertical stretch, by two. So essentially we're multiplying all the y values by two. And so remember the restriction on x, we have to be careful and notice what those restrictions are every single time. So that restriction here, we want to see what can x not be or what number would make the denominator zero for x. So here x cannot be zero because if we plug in zero for x, then we have dividing by zero. So that means that the domain is actually the same domain as the parent function from negative infinity to zero, union from zero to infinity. And then the range is also the same thing, is from negative infinity to zero, union from zero to infinity. And so just creating a simple sketch of this, we're not gonna be super exact with it. We have our rational function would look actually really similar to what we, have with the rational function originally since it's not labeled it's hard to see that there is a stretching but there is a stretching and the important characteristics that we want to look at here are the vertical and horizontal asymptotes so the vertical and horizontal asymptotes actually are the same as what we started with so this vertical asymptote here i'll draw, even draw it as a line give it some arrows this is the line x equals zero that's the vertical asymptote and we always want to write the vertical asymptotes as equations because they are lines and we write lines as equations. So x equals zero rather than just zero. And then the horizontal asymptote is the same thing as on the original parent function. It's just along the x-axis, which is the line y equals zero. And then on the next example, we have a couple of transformations happening here. We have the negative out front and we also have the subtract three down in the denominator. So the subtract three in the denominator, you can think of that as like the inside part. Remember with transformations, we're talking about inside transformations versus outside transformations. So this transformation x minus three in the denominator there, that is an inside transformation. So because of that, it's affecting the x values or it's a horizontal shifting. And that horizontal shifting, remember the horizontal shifting is always opposite of what we'd expect. So this is minus three, we'd expect it to go left because left is less but it actually goes right three. So we have a horizontal shift right three, and the negative out front, you're making all the output negative, so that means that you're reflecting the graph vertically. So this is a vertical reflection. And we wanna ask ourselves, what is the restriction on X? And this is a good practice or habit to get into. We can just set the denominator equal to zero and then solve for X. Now you might be able to just look at that and say, well, X cannot be three, but a good habit to get into is to set the denominator equal to zero because then when we solve for X, that will tell us what X cannot be. So really we should write this as X minus three cannot be zero. And then we solve for what X cannot be. To solve for this, we add three on both sides and we have that X cannot be three. So there we go x cannot be three. We can solve that algebraically. The domain, so what that means is that we can plug in any value that we want except for three. So that means we have the domain is from negative infinity to three, not including three, union from three 
to infinity. And so that's the domain here. And then the range, there's no shifting of the y value. So there's no vertical shifting, which means that the range stays the same. So the range here is from negative infinity to zero union from zero to infinity, just like the original parent function. So we have this restriction on x and it's this horizontal shifting that creates this new or different restriction. So when we shift right three, it's changing the restriction, which means it's also changing the vertical asymptote. So the vertical asymptote normally is x equals zero, but the vertical asymptote gets shifted to the right by three. So the new vertical asymptote is x is equal to three. And that is corresponding also to the restriction x cannot be equal to three. The horizontal asymptote that stays the same because there's no vertical shifting. So we have y is equal to zero. So let's draw this out, starting with the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So let's say we have the vertical asymptote right here is three. So we draw this vertical asymptote. It's finally a little bit easier to see now that's not on the y axis. And then we have the horizontal asymptote along the x axis. Draw it a little bit thicker and then draw the arrows. This is the horizontal asymptotes. So this is y equals zero and the vertical asymptote is x equals three. And then from the original parent function, so take a look at the one we have on the left here. This is close to the original parent function. We also have a vertical reflection. So the graph flips upside down. So what that means is that in the bottom left corner, that section of the graph now comes up to the top left corner. So it looks like this. And then in the top right corner, that reflects upside down. So that goes into the bottom right corner. So it looks like this. And then lastly, we now have we're, the parent function that we're working with is the one over x squared function, the reciprocal squaring function. And let's take a look at the transformation that we have here. So all we have that's added on here is this plus five on the outside, plus five on the outside. That means you're affecting the y's and you're adding five to the y's. So that's a vertical shift up by five. So I'm just going to write up five. So the restriction on x, we can take a look at this denominator. What will make the denominator zero? Well, if we plug in x is equal to zero, then that will make the denominator zero. So what that means is that x cannot be zero. That's a slash through the equal sign. So then the domain here, it's going to be the same as the original reciprocal squaring function. The domain is from negative infinity to zero union from zero to infinity. Now for the range, let's take a look at the original reciprocal squaring function. That range, remember, on the reciprocal squaring function is from zero to infinity. Both the left hand and the right hand sides go up to infinity, unlike the just generic reciprocal function. So what we're doing is we're taking this graph here and we're shifting it up by five. So what that looks like here, let's draw our um, sketch first and then we can talk about the range. So if we're shifting everything up by five, then that means we're changing what the horizontal asymptote is. So we're changing that horizontal asymptote is now y equals five. The vertical asymptote doesn't change, that's x equals zero because there's no shifting of the x values and the horizontal shifting. So we have the vertical asymptote is still x equals zero, so along that y axis. And then the horizontal asymptote is shifted up five. So it's at this height of five here. That's that horizontal asymptote. And then we can draw the graph it just looks the same as the original parent function. It's got the curves and the curves are both in the top left and, and top right corners. So this is what the graph looks like and let's label those horizontal and vertical asymptotes. So y equals five and x equals zero. So the range we can see here now is from five, not including five, all the way up to infinity. So unfortunately with rational functions, because there's a lot of different ways to write them, they don't always translate nicely to linear transformations that we've seen before from the parent functions. For example, on this first one, we can just look at this and say, oh yeah, it's just a shift left by one because it's that horizontal translation. You're adding one on the inside. But if you write something like x minus two squared in the denominator, but then you have x in the numerator, and that's where it gets tricky is when you have x in the numerator and also in the denominator, that's where the regular transformations that we talk about 
don't really translate well, no pun intended, to these functions. So we have to use some other tools to determine what are the vertical asymptotes, what are the horizontal asymptotes, those kind of things. So let's focus here on the vertical asymptotes. So this first one, we want to look and see what would make the denominator zero. Or in other words, we're solving for x plus one is equal to zero. Well, that will just give us x is equal to negative one, right? It's like going back to polynomials. We're just solving the zeros of the denominator. So we have x plus one is the factor in the denominator. So the corresponding zero is just the negative one. And so that means the restriction is that x cannot be negative 1. So that means the vertical asymptote is at x equals negative 1. So at x equals negative 1, we have a vertical asymptote, which means that the graph gets really close to that vertical asymptote, but doesn't actually cross that vertical asymptote. And then on the next one here, this is where it starts to get a little funky, is that we have x in the numerator, x minus 2 squared in the denominator. So it's the reciprocal squaring function. However, we want to solve for what would make the denominator zero. So we're looking for what would make x minus two equal to zero because we're just looking at the factors. That's the important part. So we want to look at what the factors are. So we have the factor of x minus two and that's equal to zero. So the corresponding zero here is x is equal to two because you can see if you plug in two, we're going to get a zero in the denominator. So the restriction on x is that x cannot be two. And that means that the vertical asymptote is that x is equal to 2. So let's draw that here. If we count to the right, 1, 2, we draw that vertical asymptote at x is equal to 2 here. So we have the vertical asymptote is at that x value of 2. And then on the third one, we got a, a whole mess of things happening. We've got 2x minus 7 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we have x times x minus 3. So this definitely does not translate well from what our original transformations are. But we can identify at the very least what the vertical asymptotes are, or in particular what the restrictions on x are. So we wanna set the denominator equal to zero. Essentially we say x times x minus three cannot be zero, so we want to solve for x or find the zeros here. Now you can think about this as factors. Again, we have the factor of x and a factor of x minus 3. So think about what the zeros would be. But essentially, we use the zero product property, which says that you set them each individually equal to zero, or in this case, not equal to zero. So you have x is not equal to zero. And then also x minus 3 is not equal to zero. And then you just add 3 on both sides here. So you have x is not equal to 3. So just using that zero product property with the factors, we have that x cannot be 0 and x cannot be 3. So this one, we actually have two vertical asymptotes. Those two vertical asymptotes are at 0 and at 1, 2, 3 here. So let's draw those vertical asymptotes. One is along the y-axis, and the other one is at x is equal to 3. And you can see that that chunks off or separates the graph into three sections or three windows. The first window is on the left, and then you have one in the middle, and then one on the right. And so you can see that the middle one gets kind of squeezed by the vertical asymptotes, and it's almost got that parabola-looking shape. And so those vertical asymptotes we can write as x equals 0 and x equals 3. And so the big picture idea that we're trying to hone in on here is that the vertical asymptotes occur at the restrictions on x or essentially they occur where the denominator would be zero. And the graph cannot cross the vertical asymptote because that means that we would actually be plugging in that restriction on x, which means we would be dividing by zero. So it cannot cross the vertical asymptote because we would divide by zero. So this function here, we have x plus one in the numerator and then the denominator, we have x squared minus one. So let's first identify what the restrictions are on x. So we set the denominator equal to zero. x squared minus one is equal to zero, or to be more specific, we say it's not equal to zero. So we wanna solve for x. So we add one on both sides, and we have x squared is not equal to, 
1. So to get x by itself, we apply the square root. That cancels with the squared. We apply the square root. Now this is going back to solving for all the zeros. Whenever we put the square root in, like we're solving for x, we always get two answers, a plus or minus. So what that means is that we have that there are two solutions for the zeros here. We have that x cannot be equal to positive 1 and negative 1 because the square root of 1 is 1. So the restrictions are that x cannot be positive 1 and x cannot be negative 1. But if we look at the graph, the vertical asymptote is only at 1. Now the question is, is why is the graph only at the x equals 1? Because that means if there's not a vertical asymptote at negative 1, that means that we would be plugging in negative 1, which means we'd be dividing by 0, which is not good. We cannot divide by 0. So in actuality, there is a hole, which remember we identify as an open circle. There's a hole there in the graph at negative 1 here. So there's that hole there. Now, the question you still might be asking is, well, why is there not a vertical asymptote? Why does it not have that behavior where it levels off or kind of parallel parks up to the curb of the vertical asymptote? And that's because we can simplify this rational function. So to simplify this rational function, we want to write out what the factors of the denominator are. So if we write out the factors of the denominator, this is the difference of squares, so we can write this as x minus 1 times x plus 1. You can also think of it as in the denominator we have x squared minus 1, so we're asking ourselves what two numbers multiply to negative 1 that add to the middle term, which is 0. So negative 1 and positive 1 multiply to negative 1 and add to 0. So then we have x plus 1 in the numerator. And what we have here is we have x plus 1 on its own in the numerator. And the denominator, we have two factors. And because we have it written out as factors, we can cancel or divide out the factors. So we can divide by an x plus 1 in the numerator and denominator. So what we have in the end is 1 over x minus 1. So the k of x function looks like x minus 1 in the denominator, and then 1 in the numerator. So that's what this picture really is on the graph, is the function 1 over x minus 1. You can just see it's a horizontal shifting to the right 1. However, there's still technically a 0 at negative 1. And because when we write the function as 1 over x minus 1, we're missing some information of what the original function was. And with that original function, we still, no matter what, have that restriction on x, where x cannot be negative 1. But when we simplify, it doesn't show up in the graph. But we have to make sure that we put a 0 there. So what this is called is that this is called a removable discontinuity at the x value of negative 1. And then the output value, we would just plug a negative 1 into the simplified fraction. And so that y value would be 1 over negative 2. So negative 1 half would be where that removal discontinuity is. And so we can say even further that to have a asymptote versus a hole in the graph is that we both have restrictions. However, if we can simplify, we can reduce the rational function. That's where the hole occurs is what is canceled or simplified out. And we get that by canceling out the factor that produces the restriction.